Well, tonight's topic is multiculturalism. Now, uh, words that are used in the contemporary social, political, cultural debates um, very often mean different things to different people. So I'm going to tell you what I mean by it. I'm going to tell you how I look at it. Um, if there are other meanings that are of interest to you, I'm happy to discuss them as well. I have no, uh, no reason to think that my meaning is more correct or more important or valid than anybody else's. Uh, I've seen this sort of thing that I'm going to describe said, and I've seen it defended, so I think it's of interest. But uh, as I say, if you have other things which are in the same, different, same ballpark and are described differently from the way I describe it, then we, we should talk about that. Um, multiculturalism, as I understand it, has a claim and a reason. It claims that something's true, and it gives a reason why it's true. <clears throat> the claim is that cultures should be treated equally. Every culture deserves equal respect. Every culture, if there's such a thing as validity for cultures, they all have it. And they all have it equally. No culture is better than any other culture. That's the claim. They are equal and should be treated equally. And the reason for the claim is this. Imagine you thought otherwise. Imagine you thought that one culture was superior to another culture, or at least superior in some respect. How would you go about learning that or defending that? You'd have to have some criterion by which you measure the value of a culture. And you say, OK, I have this measure. According to this measure, this culture has 16 units, and that culture has 13 units. So this is a better culture than that. OK, but where's the measure going to come from? The way you measure things is an expression of the culture that you grew up in, the culture you were educated in, the culture that you learned to think in. So when you will set out to evaluate cultures and to try to establish that one culture is better than another, and as this goes, the prejudice always is that you're going to evaluate your culture as superior to others. You're going to be doing it by using some measure of value that you derive from your culture. So right off the bat, it's obviously not fair. It's not, it's not uh, neutral, because you're using the measure from your culture to evaluate other cultures. That's apples and oranges. It's just not relevant. It can't give you anything like an objective standard. So since it's impossible to have a measure that would establish that one culture is superior to another culture, that's why you have to conclude that cultures have equal value. And since they have equal value, they should be treated equally. Is what I've said clear? OK. Now, if you're paying attention, and if you had any training in logic, you should be able to see right away that the reason for the claim, so far from supporting the claim and establishing the claim, the reason is inconsistent with the claim. The reason contradicts the claim, which is not a good position to be in. Because, go back to the reason. The reason was, if you're going to evaluate cultures, you're going to use a standard that measures their value. And that standard that measures their value comes from, if you're using it, it's going to be an expression of your culture. And therefore, that measure isn't a fair way to compare your culture, from which the measure comes, with another culture which is, to which that measure is foreign. It's not an, an objective way to compare the values. OK, but if that's true, if there can't be any fair, neutral way to measure which culture is superior to which other culture, then there can't be any fair, objective measure to determine that the value of two cultures is equal either. 
When you say the value of two cultures is equal, you're making an evaluation of those cultures. You're just coming out with an equal balance, an even scale. If you can't evaluate, you can't say one is superior to the other, and you can't say they're equal either. You just have to say, there's no way for me to establish any value comparison between them. Saying they're equal in value is a value comparison. It's just the comparison of equality rather than one being superior to the other. So if you are barred from saying one is superior to the other on the grounds that you can't make the evaluation, then you can't say that they're equal either. So that the reason contradicts the claim. It doesn't support the claim, but it contradicts it. That's bad. Questions up to here. If we, I hope we understand, uh, agree on the lie. If we don't, then we ought to have it out. So to see whether we can agree whether this logic is correct or incorrect. I think it's correct, but I might be wrong. Okay, so if, that, if what I'm saying is correct, then a person could say, I take your reason very seriously. I hear your reason. It seems to me that according to your reason, how I treat cultures is up to me. If I decide to promote this culture and to work against that culture, there's no way that I can be condemned for doing that because there's no evaluation that compares the values of the two cultures at all to say that one is superior, or inferior, or equal. That being the case, evaluation plays no role in justifying my decision or criticizing my decision. So I promote the one that I like, and I work against the one that I don't like. So I think that, in that sense, the position, as I described it, certainly fails. I think the reason is wrong. And I think the reason is wrong for deep, reason, for, for deep considerations. And when we appreciate why the reason is wrong, I hope we will get to the point where we could see that we could, we could evaluate cultures. And we could say that cultures are superior or inferior to one another, at least in certain respects. In order to get there, we have to sort of walk gradually down a path. I have a suggestion, if someone's going to talk about philosophy, deep, abstract, philosophical subjects, justice, beauty, truth, wisdom, value, and so forth and so on, as you're conducting the discussion, try to take what you're saying and apply it to a very simple, common, well-understood piece of life. Buying milk in the Makolet, casting a vote in an election, returning a lost object, brushing your teeth. Take these very grand ideas and apply them to pieces of life which you think you know right well. I know how they work. I understand them quite well. And see what you get in taking these grand ideas and applying them to these little pieces of life. My experience is that you're often surprised. Either the grand idea doesn't apply the way you thought it would apply, and in fact, the conclusions come out quite different from what you thought, which is a surprise. Or sometimes, even worse, you find that you can't apply them. You don't know how they apply. You don't know what to do with them, in which case it means there's some deep failure to understand the idea you're talking about. Either way, it's very revealing. So I suggest now we take this idea that standards of evaluation, standards of, of judgment, standards of, of uh, criticism, which are the expression of one culture can't be applied to another culture because there's a mismatch between the culture from which the standards come and the culture to which you're applying them. It's like apples and oranges. So like measuring the value of positions on a chessboard in terms of the checkers rules. You know, can he jump the next guy? <laughs> right? When in chess, you don't jump anything. That's the claim I want to examine. I want to examine it by taking examples that are so simple and silly and everyday as to be very well understood so we can draw solid conclusions about them and then see how far we get. So I'm visiting a society in the South Sea Islands. And this is what they do. There are societies that do this, actually. When a new couple gets married, they need a house, people all get together and build a house. One thing they do is they pave the floor. Here's how they do it. They, um, 
get set up the walls, and then they have a quarry with paving stones, and the paving stones are all the same size, and they send down a bunch of guys, and they say, get paving stones. So they do. They go down, they take one stone in each hand, they come back up, they make a pile. And they start to pave the floor. If there aren't enough, they send them down again, get more. If they're too many, you use the ones that they need and send them back. That's how they pave the floors of the houses that they make. Okay, I'm visiting. Hmm, I see this procedure. They put up the walls, and tomorrow, they're going to put in the paving stones. When nobody's around, I take out my tape measure, and I measure the walls. They make the walls into a rectangle, and the walls are um, 10 feet by 15 feet. Okay, 10 feet this way, 15 feet this way. Uh -huh. And now, I go down to the quarry, and I see that the paving stones are all the same size, one foot square. Hmm, 10 by 15, one foot square. So tomorrow, when they, um, when they uh, are going to pave the floor, I count out privately 75 guys, and I say, you guys go down and get the stones. Yes, sir. They go down and get the stones. Each one comes back with one in each hand. And guess what? By golly, it's exactly the right number of stones. Because 10 times 15 is 150. It's 150 square feet. 75 guys, one in each hand. It's 150 stones. It's exactly right. And they look at me and they say, wow. How did you do that? The right number? The first time? I said, well, see, you know, I learned geometry, which was created in Greece. Now, suppose a budding philosopher says, yeah, but, but, but that can't be the answer because geometry comes from Greece, and we're in the South Sea Islands. It's a mismatch. It's apples and oranges. You're taking a Greek cultural product and you're applying it in the South Sea Islands. It, it can't work. How can it work? Yeah, but it does work, right? I mean, it will work. Even though it's a Greek cultural product and I'm applying it in the South Sea Islands, it will work. So... Here's one example of something which one culture produced and works in another culture. Okay, that's simple, easy, no doubt about it, right? No doubt that it was going to be produced in Greece, and no doubt that it's going to work there to get the right number of paving stones in the first shot. That's one example. Here's another example. I'm visiting in the South Sea Islands. One day, one of the natives doubles over in horrible pain, clutching the lower left of his abdomen. Hmm, I say, lower left abdomen. It's a terrible pain. So I take out my portable x-ray machine, without which I never travel, and I, and I x-ray his abdomen. And then I take out my, um, my, uh, my scalpel, and I take out my portable anesthetic, and I give him a couple of shots, and I open him up and extract his infected appendix, and I, uh, you know, sterilize the wound, and I uh, suture him up, right? And, uh, I, and I remove, remove his pain and maybe even save his life, right? Now, could this happen? Sure, it could happen. It happens all the time. But look, the x-ray machine was made in Indianapolis. And this, uh, the scalpel came from France with a specially sharpened to a tremendous, tremendous degree. And the anesthe anesthesia was made in Italy. It's all North American and European products, all North American and European culture being applied in the South Seas. How can that work? It's apples and oranges. Yeah, but it isn't apples and oranges. No, it seems to work okay. Works okay, actually. Uh huh. so geometry works okay, and medicine works okay. Hmm, now let's try something else. I notice that these people living in the South Sea Island are very poor. They barely subsist. And I also notice that aside from houses, everyone produces all of what he needs himself. Each one has a plot of land that he works as a farmer. Each one uh, takes fabrics and, and sews them to make his clothes. Each one um, produces uh, all the implements that he has to have, uh, cooking utensils and the rest. Uh, each one goes hunting for meat uh, separately on his own and so forth and so on. It's a complete, individualized subsistence culture. So one day I called the, the chiefs together and I said, listen, 
You guys are just barely making it. You're just barely staying alive. I have a suggestion to reorganize the way you do things, and you'll have much more stuff. You'll have much more stuff. And the way I reorganize it is this. Have some people just farm. Have some people just make clothes. Have some people just hunt. Have some people just make pots and pans. Specialize your efforts, and, that way, and then trade. And then you'll be much more wealthy because a person who does one thing all the time gets better and better at doing it. He learns better and better strategies for doing it. And he'll be much more productive. So over time, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you'll find the productivity of all the basic needs of life are going, is going to go up dramatically. And as a society, you'll, be, you'll have much more wealth. Could that happen? Now here you might say, but maybe their religion is against it. Or maybe the psychology is against it. Okay, maybe. That could be. And then maybe it just wouldn't, it just wouldn't get them to do it. You wouldn't get them to agree to do it. But if they agreed to do it, would it work? Of course it would work. It's worked everywhere else in the world. There's no reason why it shouldn't work here. Of course it would work. But division of labor is a cultural product from a different culture. They don't have it. They never had it. How could it possibly work in their context? It's a cultural product from one culture being applied in another culture. Yeah, but it will work. So at this point, I think we should become a little suspicious. What did you mean when you said that the standards, the measures, the uh, uh, principles that are the expression of one culture can't be applied to another culture. Certainly doesn't sound like it's a universal rule. Doesn't apply across the board. So maybe you should rethink. Maybe you should perhaps revise your idea of what the limitations are of one, one, uh, the price of one culture for another culture. Before I come to the kind of limitation which I'm sure you're all thinking of, I'll make one more point and stop for questions, and then we'll go on to the point that I'm sure it's in the minds of all of you. And anyway, you can't compare cultures? There's no way to say that one culture is superior to another or in a particular context, particular activity, particular product. How is it that cultures borrow from one another? How is it that Coke has conquered the world? Coke wasn't invented in Zambia, but they all drink it there. Coke wasn't invented in China. They all drink it there. How's that? Isn't it because people in Zambia and people in China drank Coke and they said, hey, get this stuff. It's good stuff. We don't have it, but they have it. They invented it. It's good stuff. We think you should get hold of it. And what about assembly lines? Assembly line manufacturing, which was invented in one culture, spread all over the world, because the culture that didn't have it said, look how fast and how accurately they produce all this material. We don't have that, and look at how they do it. They do it this way. Great idea. Let's borrow it from them, copy it from them, and apply it in our culture. And what about meditation, lest I give you the impression that I'm just selling Western culture to the disadvantage of other cultures? In the 60s and 70s, when people from the West went to India and they discovered meditation, there was a tremendous importation of meditation, which hasn't stopped to this day, to the West, from India, of the, of, of the practice of meditation. Because it was something which was almost completely foreign to Western culture. There's certain sects of, of Christianity which did it. And it produced beneficial results in health and in focus, and in, for some people anyway, and in happiness, and in interpersonal relations. So I said, look, they have this technique. They've developed it. Their culture produced it. We don't have it. If we take it, our lives will be better. Is it really true that you can't evaluate at least aspects of cultures and talk about when, when one culture has something that's superior to another culture? We do that all the time. So the whole idea that it's impossible to make comparative judgments of the value of different cultures, at least in certain aspects, also seems to be wrong. So this grand idea that 
There's no evaluating cultures. There's no way to, to, de to decide rationally what's better and what's worse. They should all be treated equally. Excuse me. The attitude in the 60s and 70s was, the, in respect to mental health, the West is worse than India. And here's something from India that we could borrow that would make it better. And therefore, we should do it because we'll be, we'll, we'll be in a better situation. That wasn't a wrong judgment. Nothing in this multiculturalist philosophy can say that that was a wrong judgment. So there's a tremendous amount of uh, material that, that this cult multicultural pos position uh, doesn't get right. Um, and uh, and uh, then we have to ask ourselves whether anything's left of it that's worthy of, uh, of, uh, of support. Uh, questions up to here about what I have said that uh, the shortcomings of multiculturalism are, yeah. Yeah, that, that very well could be. There can be misunderstandings. I'm, remember, multiculturalism is a universal, absolutist position. Nobody can say anything about any culture's values. Nothing. I didn't say you can say everything and you're always right and you couldn't make mistakes. I don't have to go to the opposite extreme. I'm just saying a complete blank is gigantic exaggeration. There are definitely things we can say which, we, which are correct in evaluating different cultures. And there are definitely things we can do, taking the products of one culture, applying them to other cultures. That's definitely true. So that being the case, this universal de um, defeat that you can never say anything about, about uh, cultures at all is just dead wrong. Dead wrong. Now, the usual retreat when people hear this is to say, you're talking about facts. You're talking about m math. You're talking about science. You're talking about social organization, which produces material results. Yeah, yeah, OK. We, we agree. That can be better and worse elements of, of cultural grasp and uh, better and worse understanding the cultures. If there are cultures that still think the earth is flat, we agree that you should teach them something. If there are cultures that think that women are inferior, you should teach them something also. You know, I mean, uh, there's no question that, uh, that, there, that there are things that can be taught. But values, ethics, morality, that not. That each culture has on its own. Each culture has its own rules. And there's no way to say that one culture's rules are, be are any better than other, another culture's rules. If you are going to, eat, to, to make a judgment that this rule is morally superior to that rule, you're going to be using your morality to do that. And then it's definitely going to be an expression of your culture. And then you're, you're especially you're going to compare a rule in your culture and another culture your cultural morality is going to say that your cultural rule is superior to the cultural rule in the, the rule in the other culture because the measuring apparatus comes from your culture. So of course you're going to have the advantage. And that's not objective. It's not neutral. So the retreat will be to retreat to values. Everything I've said up until now is, I think, pretty well agreed upon in philosophy. What I'm going to say now is not agreed upon. The only thing I can say about my view is that it's right. But other than that, uh, I wouldn't expect everyone to agree with me. If anybody wants to argue it out in more detail we have tonight, I'm invited. I'm happy to do it. So let's take a look at values. One thing you will hear is that different cultures have different values. And there's no one to say that one value is more valid or, or correct or somehow uh, superior to another culture's value. Let's see if that's really true. Let's see if it's correct to say that different cultures could have different X's or Q's or whatever you like. And how far we would allow that to go, how far that makes sense. Let me give you. I mean, philosophers like absurd, silly, stupid examples, which are simple and clear, because they make a point, and then you come back to more realistic, more difficult ones. Let's try this. I'm visiting China, and I'm introduced to a game that they play in rural China. This game is played on horseback. In a shallow stream, there's a lead ball, solid lead ball, 
people are riding horses and they have long wooden poles. And the idea is to move the lead ball either upstream or downstream, depending upon which team you're on. Half the game, team A is going upstream and team B is going downstream. And the other half of the game, they reverse sides. To make progress against the other team. The team that makes most progress against the other team, in the case of the whole game, is the one that wins. Okay? Poles, lead ball in the stream, pushing it up and down. And that's a very interesting game, you know. Do you have a name for this game? Yeah. This is Chinese chess. This is chess. This is how we play chess in China. You play chess on a board with, with, with 16 pieces on each side, and you move them up and down on squares, and we play chess in the streams with a lead ball, with people on horseback, pushing it with, 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 with poles. This is Chinese chess. You have your chess, we have our chess. Yeah? This is Chinese chess? Is that meaningful, reasonable? Does that make any sense? No, it's not Chinese chess, not chess at all. You want to borrow our sound, you can have it. But don't borrow my language. If you played chess without castling, I could say, okay, in, chess they, in China they play chess without castling, and we play chess with castling, and could make a difference in your strategies, could make a difference in outcomes, might be interesting to study, but you, it's not chess if you're playing it on horseback in a, in a stream with a, with a lead ball, with poles. The English word chess can't be stretched to mean that activity in that way. Now let me lay down the fundamental principle here. Let's remember one simple fact. We are describing the situation in English. We're describing it in our language with our words, with our concepts, with our definitions. When he says to me that this foreign culture has different values from ours, he's speaking my language. V-A-L-U-E-S is my word. If he tells me, in this culture, butterflies are justice, It can't be J-U-S-T-I-C-E, because my word and my concept don't tolerate that. He's talking to me in English and suggesting to me how I, in English, should describe their reality. Well, then it's got to be meaningful in English. And there are limits to how far English can go. You could talk about taxes which take money from the rich against their will, by force, and give money to the poor, is it just? Is it unjust? We have discussions about that within our culture. Indeed, in a certain sense, on the two sides of the Charles River in Boston, you have two cultures. You have MIT on one side and Harvard on the other side. <laughs> you have uh, different cultures. Because the word justice is, it covers the way in which goods are distributed in a society, and it covers the way in people, in which people earn the goods in the society, and it covers matters of charity in addition to just a matter of fairness. All these things are taken into account in, in, in uh, the English language, as as your moral considerations, and they interact with one another, and the outcome is difficult and subtle and controversial and, and all of it. All, the, all that's true. But somebody tells you that in this culture, justice is what the chief says. Whatever he says is just, and whatever goes against what he says is, is unjust. That's not a candidate for justice. It can't be described as justice in English because we're talking about them in English. They're so different from you, you can't even describe them. Correct. That may be correct. But then you don't say that they have a different concept of justice. You say they don't have a concept of justice at all. They don't have a concept of justice. It's a free world. Who says they have to have a concept of justice? Maybe they don't do justice. They do other things. Like a shah. I don't mind that. That certainly could be correct. But that doesn't qualify for they have a different morality from yours. It qualifies for they don't have morality. Who says you own morality? I own M-O-R-A-L-I-T-Y. I own that. That's my word. That's how I talk. That's how I think. That's how my concepts are formed. You're communicating to me in my word with my concept. Then what you say has to conform to my concept. 
Otherwise, it's just wrong. So I'm not, I'm not dictating to other culture what they must do. I'm not telling them how they must live. But I am saying that when I look for a true description of what they are doing in my language, there's a limit to how far. You can stretch my words. The limit is the limit of the concepts that I have. Do concepts change their meaning over time? Yes, they do. Do we sometimes discover that what we thought were the limits aren't really the limits? Yes, we do. Of course, you can make mistakes about this. Nothing's set in stone. But there are starting points. And if somebody wants to tell me that in this culture, justice is whatever the chief says, I say, write me a book. Because as you say it offhand, it's just not right. Maybe you have some deep concept and some whole worldview that where it'll come out to be that way. I, maybe so. I'd like, to, I'd like to see it. But if all you say is that in this culture, whatever the chief, the chief says is just because he says it, then you're just misusing the word justice. In the same way as if you would say that what we would call a souffle, in that, in that culture is chairs. This is a, 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 a Zambian chair. We eat it for breakfast because it's, it's what you call a souffle, but it's our kind of chair. It isn't. It isn't your kind of chair. It isn't any kind of chair. It's a souffle. So I, and by the way, the person for whom I took this uh, would be horrified if he knew that I'm using it this way. Uh, one of the great philosophers of the 20th century, Willard van Roman Quine, made this point. Um, he wasn't the only person to make it. There was a French... I guess he was an anthropologist, Jewish fellow, friend, for, uh, Claude Lady Strauss, who claimed to have discovered pre-logical peoples. People who can hold a contradiction in their minds and believe it without any trouble. They could say, it is raining here and now, and it is not raining here and now. Have a cup of tea. <laughs> I told you, I told you the weather. It is raining here and now, and it's not raining here and now. Mm, have some tea. So, but, but, you know, how could that be? Well, people are primitive, and they don't have the same logic that we do, and so on and so on. That's what he claimed. Until somebody asked him, how do you know that's what they're saying? They don't talk French, do they? No, they don't talk French. So how do you know what they're saying? Well, I lived with them for six months, and I compiled a dictionary of their language. Oh, you did, did you? You compiled the dictionary of their language. And now they say, gobbly, 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 gook. And you take out your dictionary, and you look at the words, and you come out with, it is raining here and now, and it is not raining here and now. Maybe your dictionary is wrong. Your dictionary wasn't given to you by God. Maybe the very fact that your dictionary translates them as saying something idiotic means your dictionary is wrong. Maybe that convicts you of not getting their words and concepts right. Here's an example of how you can get it wrong. I, I, I read this. I hope it's true. Early English uh, who uh, came to Australia, and they saw the natives, and they were listening to them, what their, what the sounds they made, and trying to figure out their words. And um, they, um, they saw them when, when kangaroos went by. They said, kangaroo. So they wrote down in the book, kangaroo, biped, upright standing, uh, with a pouch, you know, creature. Actually, it turns out that kangaroo in the native language means, there it goes! Because they were always going. They were in a hurry. Right? <laughs> it was describing their speed, not what they were. What they were. Okay, so that's a pretty big of a mistake. They said kangaroo and these things were running past. So they thought kangaroo meant the animal and instead of that, there it goes. You can make mistakes with dictionaries. If your dictionary says that this guy is saying something absolutely idiotic and illogical, it's a good bet you don't understand him. Because if he couldn't tell the difference between logic and illogic, he wouldn't survive. Let's imagine a battle's going on. And your side is shooting, enemies, uh, shooting arrows at the enemies. And the guy on the wall runs out of arrows. And he says, get me more arrows. And the guy comes back five minutes later with a cup of hot chocolate. Does he notice the difference? Does he realize that that's what he asked for? That went wrong? If he doesn't know the difference, the other guys are going to win the war, and they're not going to last. They're going to be out. You can't have that kind of mental confusion and still run, lead a practical life. It's not possible. 
So it's got to be that you can get a concept that's wrong. A friend of mine, fellow named Benjamin Worf, did work with uh, what they now call uh, indigenous uh, Americans, not even Native Americans. You can't say Native anymore. <laughs> and he claimed they had no concept of time. No concept of time. Days, weeks, months, years, no concept. Because he didn't see anything in their language. That Then he discovered strings with knots in them. Oh, every month they tied another knot. Every month they tied another knot. Did they have that? Of course they had time. They just kept the time uh, uh, records in strings with knots. And he didn't notice that. So you're taking your, your concept, you're describing another reality. When you use your concept to describe another reality, your concepts come with their definitions. Somebody wants to tell you in your language that they have an, an X different from your X, but it's got to be an X. Otherwise, it doesn't deserve a description of X. Somebody wants to tell me they have different values, then what they have has to be at least within the realm of my concept of value. If it's too far out, it isn't the candidate. OK. So for example, here's one of the examples that those brutal, hard-hearted philosophers use to make their points. It is wrong to torture small children for fun. The reason they put in for fun is not because it's just cruel and heartless, but because it means there's no other moral consideration. For fun means there's no other moral consideration. You're just harming, just ca causing children harm. So that's, that's wrong. That's considered to be one of the paradigm things that's wrong. Somebody says, that's wrong in your culture. But in that, in that culture, it's right. Or it's neutral. No. It's not R-I-G-H-T. Because R-I-G-H-T is my word with my concept. And you're speaking to me in my language. And in my language, that isn't correct. We can have different disagreements about certain types of things. But about this, there can't be a disagreement unless you tell me a whole story which changes my understanding of the whole phenomenon. But as I stand with it today, that's a non-starter. So this, this is going to be an absolute limit on the multicultural idea, even in values. Even in values. It's not going to be free play. It's going to be limited by our concept of values. They could have, in their culture, something operating similar to the kinds of things we discuss and debate in, within our culture about what the right thing to do is. And we do discuss and debate various things. It's not as if our concept is perfectly precise. It's not as if our concept doesn't have gray areas. It does. It's not as if our concept has very carefully sharp edges where it, where it cuts off. But there are things that are 10 miles away, and they're not part of our concept. And at that point, it will not be correct in English to say that they have another moral rule which is like that. That will not be a correct English description of what they're doing. So even the idea of, cult, of, of, um, of values, morality, ethics, even those things are going to have cultural limits. Questions up to here? Yeah. Okay, you're raising a big question, and it, and it has lots and lots of ramifications. I'll just give a very brief, like, headlines, and maybe we can devote another year to doing it in more detail. What about differences between Jewish groups? Right? So I think it's a very good example because these things are discussed. Now, one of the differences you have in different Jewish groups is following different legal authorities. So, for example, um, Sephardim regard most of Ashkenazi meat as straight. Because Sephardim have a higher standard for kashrus of meat than Ashkenazim do. Sephardim require roughly what we call glatt kosher, whereas Ashkenazim recognize a lower level, which is also kosher. Okay. Now, having said that, where does this come from? It comes from a medieval dispute about what makes animals kosher. And the Sephardi world accepted the stronger, the more stringent opinion. And the Ashkenazi world accepted the more lenient opinion. 
does a Sephardi say to an Ashkenazi, you're going to hell. <laughs> you're going to Gehenna. You're eating treif meat. You have Tim Tum Halev. It's, it's polluting your spirituality. Chazal told us you, it destroys your spirituality. No, he doesn't say that. He says there are legal authorities. We all recognize the legitimacy, the, the correctness of the, all of the authorities. Our community has chosen to follow this authority, and your community has chosen to follow that authority. So here, everybody's within the same framework. It's a dis 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 disagreement about the particular law in question, and different groups are following different. This has nothing to do with the kinds of differences I'm talking about. Secondly, developing your own customs is a mandate for different Jewish communities. You are supposed to develop customs which enable you to, to actualize, implement the laws that have to be implemented in a way that's beneficial for your, com your community. And different communities do it in different ways. There's a reason why people from Yemen could read upside down, because they had very few books. So they stood around the book. And some people were standing, looking at it upside down, and they learned to read it upside down. Anything wrong with that? Not at all. They're reading the book. They're reading it correctly. They're reading it from a different perspective and seeing the letters in a different order. That's all. So the, there are customs dress. To a large extent, dress is just a matter of custom. The different um, texts of prayer, uh, there are minor variations in the texts of prayer are perfectly valid. Everyone recognizes the validity of everyone else's uh, sitter, just that I have my customs that I, that I inherited from my ancestors, and they have their customs they inherited from their ancestors. Now, I don't say they're not really praying or God doesn't like their prayer because of that. So none of this comes within a thousand miles of the kind of thing we're talking about. Would you say the same thing when it comes to the Orthodox versus conservative? Or? No. I would not say when it comes to respect, uh, Orthodox versus non-Orthodox. Uh, I'll also just make a brief remark about this. I divide the Jewish world into two categories. Traditionalist and, listen carefully, it's not what you expect. Traditionalist on the one hand and not only traditionalist. Meaning, there are some people who say that their Judaism is to be determined 100% by the tradition the internal Jewish tradition, which includes writings, which includes oral understanding, which includes um, various institutions, which includes various experiences. All of that is the only source for any and all Jewish expression. That's a traditionalist. The other group believes in the tradition as important. They do call themselves Jewish. Anyone who is against the tradition in principle wouldn't call himself Jewish. Well, why, why would he do that? But he's not limited to the tradition. He wants the tradition to be one of the bases of his life, but he also wants to take other things into account, either to add or to use them as a reason to subtract. So it's the Jewish tradition plus Greek philosophy, the Jewish tradition plus Roman sports, the Jewish tradition plus Parisian fashions, the Jewish tradition plus uh, equity. Or and then you have what is called I call them not only traditionalists, but the right word for them in general is reform. And I'm not distinguishing between reform and conservative and, and uh, reconstructionist and humanist and, 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 uh, and uh, um, equality and all the rest of that. It means that we are not accepting the tradition as the only source for our Jewish expression. That's the real distinction. All the rest of it is matters of degree. Um, and when I'm talking now about um, the, the principles that, that govern development and, and survival and all the rest, I'm talking about the traditionalist group. The, the, the NLT group has a very bad record. Its, its movements die out. And uh, of course, they can't agree uh, with, among them because each one of them had, has different additions and subtractions. And, and that's non negotiable because there's nothing to decide which the additions and subtractions are, are better than others. So, um, so it's, it's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not counting them in the, in the description of what, what I'm talking about. By the way, Judaism is the only world religion that has reform. There's no other religion that has reform. Reform says, let me put it brutally, 
Forum says, we know Abu Musa's believed, but we know better. Moses didn't eat pigs, but we know better than that. Moses didn't light uh, fires on Saturdays, but we know better than that. We know better than Moses. No Christian says he knows better than Jesus. No Muslim says he knows better than, than Muhammad. No Buddha says he knows better than Buddha. Doesn't happen. The only religion that rebels against its origins and says we know better than the origins is Judaism. So I, I put that on the side. It's not relevant to a, dis- a comparison between Judaism and other religions. And it's not relevant to discussing what Judaism is about since they haven't preserved what Judaism is about. They've taken some of it, and then they've changed it in various ways, each group in, its, in terms of its, its own preferences. Um, and th- there's no limit on that. There's no limit on that, and, and there's no, no reason to have any consistency in the principles of, uh, thereof. Where I have the confusion is, for example, in the U.S., English, in South Africa, we speak English, uh, but Portugal, we speak, Port- we speak Portuguese, in Brazil, we speak Portuguese, in Mozambique, in Africa, we speak Portuguese, and each of those groups will claim the language of their own, but have very different traditions or very different values. So in, in, in what sense do you, do you mean the RIGHC well, is, is mine, so don't claim it? Okay, so, and so now, I, I, let's, let me take your example, and, and I, I think I could... Go along with you with everything you said, except the last sentence. Um, different groups have different languages, and different languages may c- express different concepts, um, and they have different ways of looking at the world, and different ways of dealing with the world, different ways of setting up their societies, and different ways of interacting with one another. That's just the way the world is. That's a fact about the way the world is. But you also said, and they also have different values. Ah, but that's where I draw the line. Why do you call them values? Why do you say that other thing that they have, which we don't have, is a different value than just simply something different? It's not like us. They're not like us. Why is it a different value? What makes it a value that's different? V-A-L-U-E, you're speaking to me now in English, not in Portuguese. You're speaking in English. You're communicating to me something in English that's supposed to be true according to the meaning of the English words we're speaking. So I ask you why that thing that they have in that culture over there, you call it a different value. Why do you call it a value at all? What about it makes it a value? It can't be, it's got to have some relationship to the meaning of the word value in the language that we are speaking, you and I together, to try to describe them. The alternative would be to say, it's not a value, it's not a different value, it's just something else. Don't use our English word at all. Indeed. Say it's a different value, it's a kind of imperialism. It's got to be something that I can describe with my language, so it's a different one of mine. Who says it's one of yours at all? Maybe they don't have values at all, they just do different things. I don't think you can escape this because you're speaking your language with your meanings and you're trying to apply it to their world. Well, it may not fit. Well, it depends what you mean, allow, and okay. If allow means we don't punish it, and okay means we don't look down on it, that's just a description of their attitudes. That's fine. That has nothing to do with morality. Wouldn't that show a different uh, uh, value, but only in their, their, whatever their word would be for value? But why would you call it a word for value? Why not simply say they do things differently and they don't have values? When you use the word value, you have to, you're using an English word with its English meaning to apply to their reality. Right. There has to be something in their reality that justifies that. Is this, is this just an argument of semantics then? I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to get, in other words, if we went to their culture and we yeah. see them abusing children just mm-hmm. for fun, mm-hmm. and in, another, in, a, in our culture we don't, so there's a difference of uh, fill in the blank, value or whatever you want to Oh, no, but I'm sorry. Uh, let's let's, let's try, to, try to make the example relevant, right? There are criminals who do things that are wrong. That doesn't mean they have different values. They're just criminals. Okay. So the fact that they do things differently doesn't mean they have a different value. That doesn't follow at all. Right. But you just appeal to what they're at practice. You said they do it and we don't do it. That's not relevant to what's, what's valuable. 
Value is not what you do. People violate their values all the time. That doesn't mean the values aren't there. It's too simple to talk just about what they do. Value is more about what you criticize and the, the consequences of, of, of the criticism and whether it's social or whether it's individual and what you do about dissent is a much more subtle matter than just what you do and what you don't do. Right? I, I think that's, that's, that's very important. You can't bring a, a proof of having different values just from different behavior. That you cannot do. Even if it's accepted by everybody? It's well, even, it's even, even there also because your decisions that you make about what to do are based on two, two factors, your values and your, conce con con your conception of the reality. And their conception of the reality may be very different. I'll give you an example, which is in anthropology books. I don't know if it's true or just meant as an example, but it's supposed to be an Eskimo community where when the parents reach the age of 60, the children kill their parents. Man, how's that for different values, guys? You know, that's really on the page, hey? Right? But it isn't, because in their belief system, when you die, you go into an eternal afterlife with the mental equipment you have at the moment of death. And there is such a thing as senility. And it's a tragedy to spend eternity mentally impaired. So children kill their parents so that their parents will have an ideal, eternal afterlife. So they're being merciful. Correct. Which shows you that when you see somebody do something, you can't read values off their actions. You have to know how they think about their actions, what they think the reality is that they're living with. You don't have that information. You can't read values from it. Maybe just a difference of opinion about how the world works. These are, these are, these are matters which have to be taken into account. If they're not taken into account, the whole discussion is, is, is incompetent. Humans are born. Yeah, it's just... I'll call you back in about 20 minutes. I'm in the middle of the year. Yeah. Humans are born with a certain, with a certain ingrained value system, especially when he talks about, let's say, uh, the Jews are born by Shana, or Kamanim, all these things that are, that are, that are, that are ingrained in, 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 human, in human nature, it, as, a, as, a, as a nature thing, that, that we, don't, we don't torture people, we don't, we don't do all these things, and if not, you're psychologically messed up, so to speak. If not what? If not given it, 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 why are we calling it values? Why are we calling it morality? We should call it something that's 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 just it's something ingrained in, in human nature. Just like people don't want to get hurt, they and they'll and they'll step back as 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 a as a, as a, sub, a subconscious uh, like. Because it isn't that way. It surely isn't that way. Uh, it's a, it's a <laughs> Normal people. But first of all, what you're saying is not true. You're not born with anything. Uh, it's not ingrained in your, in your DNA. The Rambam is very clear about this. The Rambam says you are born with the disposition to develop certain types of, uh, of, of uh, uh, values through your experience. There's a Gemara in, in Erevin, which is, I mean, so many Gemaras are so profound, but you just have to be in my position to see it. Gemara in Erevin says the Torah had not been given, we would have learned industry from the ant, we would have learned privacy from the cat, right? Think about what that says. If the Torah had not been given, we would have learned. We've learned it. Learned it through experience. Not born with it. Not born with it. No, we would look around at the world. We'd see things in the world. And certain things in the world would impress us. And we would learn it from experience. And indeed, you have to ask, you know what a sloth is? They're in, South, they're in Australia. They sleep 16 hours a day. So instead of learning industry from the ant, why would we learn laziness from the sloth? But that's what Chazal say. Why wouldn't we learn a lack of steers from a dog rather than learning steers from a, from a cat? Because we're pre-programmed to be affected by the experiences that we have. Some things will naturally draw us, and some things will naturally repel us. But if you don't have the experiences, you won't develop anything at all. That, that natural thing that's going to draw you is what I'm referring to. But, but isn't what you said. You said we're born with it. Okay, but that is wrong. That's all. It's just wrong. It's the wrong idea. Okay. So now the question is this. When you look at a person who is not a Baishan or Rachman or Gomer Chosadim, right? Maybe he's Jewish and didn't have the right experiences. <clears throat> Maybe he's Jewish and didn't have the right experiences. Maybe it's not, a, and not something that you can tell always from behavior. It's something which a Jew will develop if he's subjected to the appropriate experiences. And other people who are subjected to the same experiences won't develop it to the same extent. But if he's not subjected to the appropriate experiences, 
that he'll never develop it. Take language. There's a certain period of time in life where you're, it's a window for your, if your brain to develop to, to use language. There have been children who have been victimized and kept in isolation. And when they take it out of isolation, let's say at the age of 10, they never learn to speak a language competently because the window closed. This child was linguistically competent. He just didn't have the right experiences, and therefore he didn't develop language. So you're talking here about a tendency to develop certain characteristics through experience. I'm not talking about something that you're born. That's number one. And number two, you know very well, people who develop these characteristics, and they know stealing is wrong, do steal, right? The, the eight Sahara is satisfactory to convince them that, to steal under certain circumstances. So that being the case, it isn't true that when you recognize the value, you automatically carry it out. After all, what is harata? Harata means I did it, and I realize it's bad, and I wish I hadn't done it. That means that even something that's bad, you could do. Yeah, some people have harata while they do it. They lose their temper, and, and they know that they shouldn't lose their temper. And while they do it, they're regretting it, but they're losing their temper anyway. So it's simply not true that if you have values, you're automatically going to do them. You'll, be, you'll have a tendency to do them. You'll have a natural motivation to do them, but it doesn't always win. It doesn't always determine the outcome. That's the concept of free will. Then. Correct. Exactly right. But you're still born with it. Just Hashem gave you that, that. Again, you're not born with anything. You're stuck on that, on, on that vocabulary. It's wrong. You are born with the ability to develop it under certain circumstances, right? But what do you develop? You don't develop robot-like automatic behavior, you develop a motivation to move in a certain direction. But you have other motivations also. And they're at war with one another. There's a neshama and a goof. And the, and the rot zone decides between the pull of the neshama and the pull of the goof. Right? And the pull of the goof is there even when the neshama develops the right values. The pull of the goof is still there. That's why we have free will to be able to do the wrong thing knowing that it's the wrong thing. The bottom line is when you've developed the right values it doesn't mean you always perform the right values. That's all. Right. That's all. With one question over here, somebody, yeah, no. I was going to ask, today we learned uh, such a concept as the, the, the Pope. Of what, sir? Was a Pope pop, popular in infallibility? Uh, I was wondering if that concept could be an example of what we're discussing. Like, we have no such concept. I know. Papal infallibility. Yeah. You see, you have a problem, but this isn't going to quit. Uh, you have a problem. You, if, you, if you're given a law to live by, how do you interpret it? Suppose there's a misunderstanding of it. Suppose new, new realities arise and you don't know what to do, how to, how to apply it, right? So as far as I can figure out philosophically, there are only two ways out. The creator has only two choices. Either he says, I give you my Torah, it's yours, figure it out. And if you get it wrong, you get it wrong. Or he says, I'm not trusting you. I'm going to give you information from time to time about how to do it, and then it will surely be right because it's coming from me. Those are the two ways to do it. Here. The Torah, on the one hand, and Lahav of Christianity parted company, certain parts of Christianity, right? The Torah, it's, we're coming to the Chag of Matan Torah. That's not a joke. And it's not poetry. It means he gave it to us. It's ours. It belongs to us now. The major says it's like a king who marries off his daughter to another king, and, and she goes off and lives with the other king. And we make mistakes. When Horius says, what to do when you make a mistake? We make mistakes, because Rogel said, I gave it to you, I want you to administer it, to analyze it, to apply it, make mistakes, you'll make mistakes. Right? Christianity said, no, we're not tolerating that. We'll have God come in from time to time to correct things and make sure that the things are right. So, uh, but we have no such concept. No human being, and no group of human beings is infallible. Only God is infallible. So mistakes will be made. That's the way it is. Ein novi rashai lechadesh dover me'atov say chazal. Not a single halacha can come from a novi. If a novi says, "Gentlemen, you discussed the Sanhedrin, cancel the discussion. God told me what to do." He dies. Lo vashemayim he said, "Yo, Rabbi Yeshua, right? The Torah is not in heaven." What a chutzpah! How could Rabbi Yeshua say that? How could he say the Torah is not in heaven? How could he cut off God from interaction? How did he do that? You know how he did that? He's quoting Deuteronomy. Hello. Those are God's words, not Rabbi Yeshua's words. God said, Lo Okay, so he said, I want you to do it, and I'm not interrupting. I'm not interfering. Okay.